The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Every time I go to my ophthalmologist, I give thanks that I was not born back in the Middle Ages. I am legally blind without my contacts. I think my correction is something like 2950 and 20, a thousand and something. So without my contacts on, I can't, I can't function. And I probably would have fallen off a cliff or something if I'd lived in the medieval times or been eaten by some wild animal or something like that. So from time to time, I have to get new contacts, and sometimes they fool around with the prescription a little bit. And one time when I picked up a pair of new contacts, I put them on and I began my day, but something was clearly wrong. I tried to focus on things in the distance, but they were blurry. Then I tried to focus on things that were up close, but they were also blurry. So I switched around the contacts. I put the right one in the left eye and the left one in the right eye, thinking at first that they may have been mislabeled. At first it seemed a little better, but then I had the same problem. I switched them back. Then I switched them again and nothing worked. I was distressed and disoriented all day long. And I began to wonder if there was really something wrong with my eyes. Well, I finally decided there must have been something wrong with the contacts themselves. So I took them out and I sent them back and sure enough, there was something wrong with them. Many of you I know wear glasses, if not for nearsightedness, then for reading, which I also have to re wear reading glasses. Many of you have had cataract surgery and I've heard you talk about that. 
so that you know that having your vision distorted is extremely disturbing. If you've ever tried to wear someone else's glasses and, and just been taken aback by your lack of being able to see, you'll know what I mean. But it's also disturbing and disorienting when we realize that our vision or our perception of a situation is distorted. Many of you participated in our book study back last summer, I believe it was. Um, and many of you said that your vision, your previous vision or your previous perception of things you, you had realized was wrong. Many of us changed our perception, our vision of racism and the pervasiveness of white privilege from having that experience. It's disturbing and disorienting when we realize that our vision or our perception of a situation is distorted. Now, Peter loved Jesus. He was one of Jesus's most enthusiastic followers. He was always right there, always at Jesus's hand to do whatever needed to be doing. He was the first one to say, let's go to Jerusalem with him. Um, even though they knew they might be killed. Peter loved Jesus, but Peter's vision of Jesus's mission was distorted. He simply could not believe that Jesus would have to suffer and die. So Peter tried to talk Jesus out of it. And I imagine that that was probably one of Jesus's most powerful temptations to give in to Peter's wish to not go through to the end, to not go to Jerusalem and death. But Jesus would not give in to that temptation. So he rebuked Peter as strongly as he could. Get behind me, Satan, he said, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter must have been disoriented and very disturbed after this encounter with Jesus. Because he had to realize and admit to himself that his view, his vision, his perception of Jesus was an illusion. Now, to be fair to Peter, remember that none of the disciples was really able to understand Jesus's path of suffering until after the resurrection. So it wasn't just Peter. It's very disorienting and disturbing to know that, to find out that your vision, your perception of a situation is an illusion. One of the spiritual tasks of Lent can be for us in self-examination and discernment to look at our illusions that we are holding, to correct our vision, to correct our perception. Those of you who get Richard Rohr's emails from the Center for Action and Contemplation um, yesterday was very pertinent to this. It said, every viewpoint is a view from a point. Every viewpoint is a view from a point. We all have personal and cultural biases, many of which we are not conscious of. 
unless we really look like a lot of us did when we read that book together, Waking Up White. All kinds of personal and cultural biases that we have, it's a normal part of being human. But we can look at those as part of our spiritual work in Lent. So what illusions might we still be holding on to? One great illusion of life that um, is large in our society and many societies is the illusion of separateness, the denial of the connectedness of all creation, of all living things. This illusion gives us the idea that we can just wall ourselves off from the rest of the world as if what we do doesn't have consequences for other people, as if what other people do doesn't have consequences for us. If we have looked carefully, we have seen the lie of this illusion, the illusion of separateness, the denial of the connectedness of all created beings in the effects of pollution, clear cutting, strip mining, global climate change on the ecosystems worldwide. And you would think that any illusions of separateness would have been dispelled by the rise of the COVID-19 virus. Because that as clearly as anything has shown how we are all connected across this planet. How something that happens in one place can have consequences for all places. And yet this illusion of separateness, this denial of connectedness of all creation is still really embedded into our culture and many cultures. And many people still hold on to that illusion. I wonder whether enough people will see the truth in our connectedness, whether the wealthier people in the world will come together to make sure that the poorest countries also can vaccinate their people soon enough. I wonder if enough people will be willing to sacrifice what is needed in order to slow the rate of global climate change. Another illusion that Peter may have had, and that many of us have at one time or another, is that there is no cost to our faith, that we can get by without giving something up for our faith. But Jesus spoke to the disciples and the whole crowd saying, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. There is a cost to discipleship if we embrace discipleship fully. There is a cost and Jesus is telling us that in today's gospel. So this Lent, might we look a little more closely at ourselves? Might we do some self-examination and discernment about our own cultural and personal biases and illusions? And might we try to see the world as God might see it. Of course, none of us has the whole truth. 
but we can seek to try to see the world as God sees it. Do we see the connectedness of all people and of all living things and the importance of all of our actions? Or is our vision too distorted by the false lenses of our culture of individualism, of greed and of fear? If we can see the world through the lenses of love and compassion as God sees the world, how might that change us and how might that change the world? One of my favorite hymns, which is an eighth century Irish verse, speaks to the desire to have God be in our seeing or to have us see as much as we can, the way that God sees the world. So I'm just going to end this sermon with this as a prayer. I will sing it um, as a prayer for us all this Lent. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. All else be not to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, thy known may I be. Thou in me dwelling, and I one with thee. May we all ask and be given the help to see the world as God would have us see it. Amen.